Hello everyone. Hello. It's lovely to see you all. Welcome back to our study series in the book of Isaiah. For those watching at home, please pause this video now and read for yourselves Isaiah chapter 1 as we have just done so together. And don't forget to like and share this video as this really helps us get the good news of Jesus Christ out to as many people as possible. Thank you. Right, I would like you all to picture a court scene drama. Ones that you have probably seen on the telly. Some of us have been actually involved in them in, in person. What you have on the bench is a big scary judge with a wig and a rope. Can you see him? Can you picture him in your head? Then you have the prosecution counsel with all their paperwork and evidence that is against the accused in the stand who is about to get cross-examined. Do, do you have that picture in your head of the, of the court scene? That's what we have here in chapter one. It's a court scene drama. We have the judge. Who can guess who the judge is? God. God. Amen. Yes. And the accused in the stand? Well, it's the people of God. Israel. And then the prophet Isaiah, who is announced here in verse 1, he is the prosecution. Verses 2 to 4, the charges are read out against the accused. You have rebelled against God, you have turned your back on the Holy One, you are evil, you are idiots, e even a donkey knows his master, but you have forsaken your Lord. That's the charges. And, and these are strong accusations that, that if the accused is found guilty, well, they're facing a serious punishment. If they are guilty of forsaking the source of eternal love and life, what awaits them? Eternal death and hate, which the Bible calls hell. hell. So the defendant here is in really big trouble if found guilty. Verse 5 to 10 then. The charges are evidenced against the accused. And the counsel begins with Exhibit A. Uh, verse 5. You have injured your head. You have an afflicted heart. Proof that you have turned against the living God. Exhibit B. Verse 7 to 9. Your land is desolate. Judah is a battlefield. Proof that you have turned against the living God. I want to paint a picture here of what Isaiah is describing in these verses. Have you seen on the news the images of, of the Donbass and the Hans in Ukraine? Where there's the trench warfare. It's just mud. Broken tree stumps. No leaves, there's nothing green <coughs> left. It's all been burnt and blown up. Utter destruction, utterly lifeless. This is what Isaiah is talking about here. And it's proof that you have turned against the living God. Life has gone from your land. <coughs> and finally then, we have a real slap in the face here from the prosecution. Exhibit C, verse 9. If it was not for God preserving a remnant, you would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. You need to understand how offensive this language is to a Jew. It's like me calling Wayne English. <laughs> you wouldn't like that, would he, Colin? No, he wouldn't. But 
but jokes aside, this is seriously offensive wording. It would be like me calling Nov for church a church of paedophiles and terrorists. Would any of you like that? <laughs> no. This is how strong these words are from Isaiah to the people. How damning that their offence to God really is. Look at this, verse 10. Hear the words of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. <sighs> He's causing a right upset here. And then the prosecution rests. Verse 11 onwards, you hear the defence of the accused. Israel are now are on the stand. And their defence is that they're, they're, they're saying, we have not forgotten you, God. We have not turned our backs on you. We have brought you burnt offerings. Verse uh, 13, we, we have lit incense to you, God. Verse 14, we have been obedient to the festivals. We have honoured the Sabbath. Verse 15, we have prayed to you. We have been good, religious law-abiding people. We have not turned our backs on you. And then the defence rests. The response from the judge, verse 12, you are trampling on my court. You are trampling on my court. Because the reality is, Israel had <coughs> turned their backs on God. The one that called them out of Egypt, the one that gave them the promised land, their Lord and their Redeemer, their life giver, Israel had rejected him. Yes, Israel was still religious, that they still had their temple, they were still sacrificing animals in accordance to the law, but, but this religion was merely ceremonial. They did religion with the wrong motives. Their hearts were not in the right place. They were acting out. They had all the pomp and ceremony, but they were, verse 17, unjust. They were oppressing the orphans, they were forgetting the widows, they were ignoring the people who God really loved. <coughs> Amen? Amen? They were worshipping God in name only, but not putting their faith into practice by loving others. They were lighting candles and saying their prayers and being good people but they failed to look after the weakest in society. Why? Because their religion was for themselves, to make themselves look good, to make themselves feel better, not for others. They were proud, they were greedy, they were materialistic, they were lustful, they were adulterers, they were idol worshippers. And they were doing all of this, hiding behind their religion. They had failed to honour God. Despite their religion, Israel was guilty as charged and were to face the consequences for their actions. Which were, verse 24, wrath that will remove all their impurities. Holy fire and judgment that will burn away the dross. You all still with me? Yeah. The court had heard all it needed to hear. Israel were banned to rights. What awaited them? The death penalty. This was serious stuff. Yet God, who is gracious, gave them a way out. Hallelujah. God, the judge, 
offered Israel, the accused, a plea bargain. Isn't that incredible? The judge offers Israel, God's people, total acquittal from their sins, total forgiveness for everything that they were on trial for. Utter freedom, all their chains removed, and the door of the cell left wide open for them to just walk, walk home through. Israel, you are free to go. Hallelujah. You're free to go if, verse 16, you agree to be washed clean. Amen? If, verse 17, you agree to turn back to God and do the right thing. Repent, turn from your sin, and all will be forgiven. Hallelujah. That's the gospel. Amen? Amen. Israel are as guilty as charged before the judge of the universe. The evidence is clear to see. They deserve to be wiped out, wiped off the face of the planet, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. To have holy fire rain down upon them. Yet the judge of the universe says to them in verse 18, Come, now let us settle the matter. Isn't that beautiful? Should we say those words together? Come, let us settle the matter. This is the gospel. This is the beautiful gospel. Hallelujah. My dear brothers and sisters, in Christ we are all Israel. Yes? We have been grafted in to the true vine. We are God's people, yes? We are the elect. We are the chosen. We are those who have wrestled with God and lost, putting ourselves to death to follow him. We are disciples. We are children of God. And just like Israel, we have not loved God as we should have. Just like Israel of old, we have turned away from God to do our own things. To follow our lust and our desires and our flesh. And in doing so, we, we forget the orphan. We forget the widow. We forget the poor and the impressed. Those who God loves. Because we're too busy chasing our own greed our own pride and we do it tragically whilst hiding behind our religion we are worse than those in our valley who do not know God that's the reality the truth is we all deserve judgment and it is coming for us holy fire amen we discussed this last time, didn't we? Holy Father. Whether it will be at our moment of death or, or if Christ returns before then, uh, at that moment, we will all have to enter the court scene depicted here in Isaiah chapter 1 and we will all have to give an account to the judge. All of our sins will be declared before the angels and saints. Everything will be made known. There's no higher truth than God. He sees all and knows all. Amen? All those secrets you have that you can keep from me and the church will all be exposed. Fact. Amen? And the question that Isaiah asks us today in chapter 1 is this. What will you say to the living God, the judge of the cosmos, who knows all and sees all? What will be your defence? If it's when I went to church to Sunday, and I'm such a really good Christian, I also come to the prayer meeting on Wednesday, and if I can't make it, I watch Pastor John's videos on YouTube, what will God's reply be to you? Verse 12, you are trampling on my court. 
That's what he's going to say. It is no good being religious if you continue to choose a path of selfishness. Do you know what really breaks my heart on a Sunday when I preach the gospel? When people come up to me and say, John, I really needed that. Well, it's not about you. It's not about your needs. That's not the gospel. I'm not here to make you feel better. Go to a well-being centre for that. Church isn't about you. It's about others. Amen? You die to follow Christ and to love others. That's Christianity. Amen? If you continue to choose a path of selfishness, there's no good being religious if you're not serving others. If you're coming to church to make you feel better, you've missed the point. It's not about you, it's about him and them. That's church. That's Christianity. Him and them. So we share that together. Him and them. That's what church is about. You do not come for yourself. You do not come to make yourself feel better. If you come and feel better, great. But that's a byproduct. It shouldn't be the motive. You come for others. Amen? You come to encourage others and to show them that Christ lives in you. That's what church is. Friends, one day we will have our day in court. And on that day, God, the ultimate judge, he will see your hearts and your motives. And if your path has been one of selfishness, if your Christian, Christian life has been one of self, God will allow you to continue on that path into the eternal isolation of hell where your selfishness will be honoured with what it deserves, where your pride can be met with the wrath that it calls for. Those who make a defence for themselves in court, claiming their good deeds and religious works, their deeds will be judged accordingly as a mockery before the living God. Only those who accept the plea bargain offered by the judge himself will be acquitted. Amen? God, God himself says, verse 18, now let us come and settle the matter. Isn't that a beautiful verse? We have done what is wrong. God wants to settle it for us. That's grace, isn't it? Hallelujah. Isn't that a beautiful verse? God settles the matter for the guilty and he offers forgiveness for all those who put self to death to follow him and love others. Hallelujah. And he did this ultimately through his son. What's his name? Jesus. Amen. Jesus the Christ, who on the cross settled the matter. He settled the matter. He, he lived the perfect religious life that the Jews here claim to be living. He did it perfectly. He lived the life that none of us could. And on the cross, he exchanged his perfect life for our sinful life. He took the justice we deserve for our sins that cut us off from, from God our dirty little secrets, our lies, our filthy desires, our deep regrets. Jesus took it all unto himself on the cross and he buried it. Amen? As far as the east is from the west, I see your sin no more. Hallelujah. Verse 27. Zion will be delivered with justice her penitent ones with righteousness. That happened at Calvary, friends. Justice was done on the cross 
those who repented were given Christ's righteousness. What a verse that is. Written 700 years before Jesus' birth, you have Calvary's Hill summarised in just a few words. Isn't that beautiful? By his blood, Jesus washes us clean so that we can be as white as snow. This ties into Sunday's message, doesn't it, with the wedding dress. God speaking to us. We, the guilty sinner, can be clean. Hallelujah. God says, come, let us settle the matter. Can we say that together? Come, let us settle the matter. Grace after grace after beautiful grace. Salvation is all of him. Amen? In Christ, justice was done so that the guilty sinner can go free. Even Pastor John, I'm a wretch. He's delivered me. Thank you, Jesus. By his blood, he has blessed me with grace so that today I am free to repent. Free to turn from sin. Free to put myself to death to love God and love others. That's the gospel, amen? amen. Isaiah wrote these words 700 years before Christ was born that they were relevant to the, to the geopolitical affairs of the original readers, that these words warned them of their failings and, and offered them a way back to God through the Messiah, in whom they could know reconciliation with the one who they had turned their back upon. And these ancient words, ancient words, they're just as relevant for us all today, aren't they? Don't we need to hear these same truths? We live in a world of petty, selfish, consumer religion that rejects the living God. Isaiah calls us to the courtroom. He makes known our sin and he points us to Jesus. And Jesus makes a plea bargain for us. He says from the cross, I have settled the matter. It's settled, it's done. It is finished, amen? amen? I have washed you clean with my blood. I am your righteousness. I am your freedom. Avoid the judgment that is coming. Be penitent. Put yourself to death. Follow me. Love others. Turn from your, from your sin. Seek my face and live. Amen?